Thanks. Okay, after all. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm Mitchell O'Hara Wild, Mitch, and I'm a PhD student, so please keep that in mind when uh, reviewing my slides here and uh, my presentation. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of work in reconciliation, specifically in graph theory, and using graphs to represent and uh, reconcile time series forecasting. And I'm going to uh, talk about one very small part of it that I think has a very big impact on how we will reconcile forecasts into the future. So a brief recap, fortunately I'm going third, so you're already very familiar with reconciliation, uh, but I want to talk a little more about the three types of reconciliation problems we usually solve. Uh, the first uh, that was used is hierarchical, and this is a strict disaggregation, meaning that you've got a single top level series, and there's only one way to go down to the bottom of the time series. So this looks like a tree if you're familiar with graph theory. The second one looks a little more complicated, and this has been state of the art for a very long time now. Uh, this is grouped reconciliation or group structures. And it's very similar to hierarchical. It just means that there's multiple ways you can get down to the bottom. So often you've got different dimensions and you can go down different pathways through those dimensions to the very bottom level. And then last year at ISF, I talked about rack structures for representing uh, coherent time series. And the difference between graph and group, slightly more general, it does away with the assumption of requiring to go all the way to the bottom. And it also allows you to have multiple top levels. So it's a much more flexible framework. And today I'm going to talk a little more about how graph can help you forecast very large time series. So <laughs> clearly from today, we love our reconciliation. Uh, it improves forecast accuracy and uh, adaptation of the word group box. Uh, all forecasts are wrong, of course, but if you make them coherent, at least it's less wrong. Um, and at times it can be difficult to work with reconciliation, especially when you have lots of dimensions that you want to disaggregate over, because this requirement to go to the very bottom level um, makes for very large collections of time series. We'll see that today. So when you've got too many time series, it becomes very expensive to produce your forecasts. And I believe there's also some problems with the accuracy when you produce very large collections. So hopefully I can help you make uh, more love reconciliation more today. So to, speak, to explain what I'm doing here, I'm gonna use uh, page views of the forecasting textbook. So I think this title is quite interesting. Forecasting textbook page views is both what I'm doing and the data set itself. Uh, so this is Google Analytics data since 2020. Uh, this is roughly when FPV3 started uh, being widely available and widely used. And we've got daily data on page views, also users uh, as another dimension you might like to look at. And there are many dimensions in which we can disaggregate the number of people coming to this website. I think there's more than 100, about 200 dimensions. Um, but some of the more relevant ones is location, such as continent, country, city, even uh, latitude, longitude, based on the IP geocode. Uh, if they've been to the website before, what device, a smartphone or a laptop or a desktop they're going on the website with, and also the web path. So if they're on a specific chapter of the textbook, for example. So I'm going to gloss over pretty much all the details of the forecasting of this time periods. Uh, it's not that important and it's not that interesting, um, but I will talk about how this data is structured and how we can simplify the massive scale of this data as we decide to it. That's far more interesting. So here is the top level data. There's quite a lot of structure going on here. It's daily, so we have a lot of up and down. That's the weekday and weekend effect. And you see broadly there's a trend increasing in this data, and it's not so obvious in this time series, but there's also an annual seasonal pattern, uh, often relating to holiday effects and also teaching. <laughs> so on the right here, I have the uh, graph representing this one time series. And at the very top, I've got the code, essentially, for describing this uh, overall structure. And currently, I'm not disag disaggregating by any of these dimensions. If I split this up by continent, uh, you can see I've colored continent and now on the graph, I've disaggregated the top level series by continent. I get a few different time series and you've got very different dynamics within them. I particularly like looking at Oceania here, Australia, the birthplace of reconciliation forecasting. And we teach this a lot. <laughs> you can see semester one, semester one the next year, semester uh, one. <laughs> and 
this right here at the end of every semester. You can all get what that might be, all of the students cramming for the exam. Uh, but also we've got about four assignments and a major project, and that corresponds very well to these peaks in the history. You got the pack formation. Mm -hmm. You got the pack. Yes, it's very sharp increases for the start of the semester and a drop right at the end. They no longer care about forecasting. <laughs> Um, you also see similar patterns in other continents, uh, less strong, of course, because there's uh, more coursework in more universities, and uh, we teach a lot of forecasting students in Australia. You can take away the robot. Hmm? You can take away the robot record. Um, it should be fairly clean. Google takes care of a lot of that. Okay, so now we've gone to the continent. I'm going to go one step deeper <laughs> into the subcontinent, and I'm going to focus on Europe here. We're in Europe, so that sounds reasonable. We've got Eastern, Northern, Southern, and Western Europe. And these time series all have a decent amount of signal. Most of the signal is coming from Western Europe. You can see a very strong weekly signal pattern in that time series. Uh, perhaps they really enjoy their weekends more than their weekdays. So one step further, now let's look at uh, Northern Europe, like I went into. And now we've got various countries within Northern Europe. And you can see some of these countries don't have a lot of data. And this poses a challenge for forecasting. What is uh, the appropriate model for this very intermittent time series? Uh, the number of visitors from Monaco. Uh, Monaco. What about uh, Liechtenstein? There's not many forecasters in these countries. And producing an appropriate model that makes accurate forecasts for these, other than just zero, uh, they're not very helpful in the whole reconciliation problem. One step further, we're in France. So let's have a look at France. And I'm now disaggregating by the different device that they looked at the website on. And you can see one person uh, last year visited on a smart TV. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's useful to forecast how many people from France are coming to the FAP website on their smart TV. <laughs> and I don't think there's any value in forecasting this. It certainly doesn't add much information to the, uh, uh, the hierarchy. And it's probably going to worsen the forecasting performance rather than improve it. At the very least, the computation time is all wasted. That's why it's not it? Possibly. <laughs> but you see most people come on desktops, slightly fewer on mobile, and not many people on tablets and computers. So this is the big idea of the talk, graph pruning. We have many time series that are not interesting or useful at all for reconciliation, and we don't want to forecast them. So let's not forecast them. Less computation, less model misspecification. Who knows why that person went on the website with their TV? And hopefully we get better accuracy as a result as well, results ending. So this is all possible because of the graph representation. Because we no longer have to go down to the very bottom, uh, it's possible to maintain the coherency constraints without that requirement, disaggregating all the way down. And this has several advantages. So maintaining coherency is a little bit more nuanced. You can't just remove a time series. Uh, if I removed France, suddenly the total number of uh, visitors from Northern Europe won't add up to the bottom level. So we need to be a bit more careful in how we identify uh, not interesting time series, or not very forecastable is what I'm terming it, and how we overall decide all or nothing. Do you want to keep all countries in Northern Europe or none of them? So I call this the disaggregation rule. So here's an automated uh, idea for using features in order to traverse this graph and find what's interesting and what's not, and only keep the time series that will contribute useful information for reconciliation. So we start from the very top level of the time series, because that's where it usually has the most signal, most information. And then using each of the dimensions, we disaggregate. In each step of the disaggregation, we calculate some features, some indication of how useful or forecastable this time series is. And then we use our disaggregation rule to decide if all of those disaggregations down that path is worth pursuing further, or if there's not enough signal left, and that's where we should stop, removing all of the ones below it, because if one is not interesting, all of its children, all of the disaggregates of that are also not interesting. And then, of course, we repeat this through all of the dimensions, through all of the graph, until we either uh, reach very non-interesting data, or we get to the bottom, and we can't disaggregate anymore. So a fairly simple idea, but I think it's quite powerful. 
looking at this top time series again. Is this interesting? Does this have value? Uh, yes, we pass it through our features. We can automate that and classify this as green. Yes, we want to keep this. And then the next step is to disaggregate. So once again, I split this up by continent. And then I decide for each of these, is it interesting or not? The first continent here is an offset. This just means there wasn't location information. And you can see most people had some location information. There's not a lot of signal in that top one. Not interesting. I will still have to forecast this, though, because the other ones in the disaggregate are interesting. And in order to make sure they're out to the previous time series that I wanted to keep, I need to have all of these. But when I disaggregate further from this, I'm not going to disaggregate this one anymore. This one's already not interesting. I'll keep this as it is. What I will do <coughs> is disaggregate Europe again. And I'll also disaggregate Africa, Americas, Oceania, Asia, all the other ones throughout the computational process. And all of the subcontinents of Europe are interesting. There's enough signal here to do something useful. Again, you can set these criteria based on features for however much patterns and signals you want to keep or remove. Then going back into Northern Europe, splitting up by countries, we can see that uh, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Monaco, they're all very sparse, not a lot of signal there. So I'm going to stop disaggregating at that level. The other countries still have enough patterns for me to go further down. And I repeat, for the last level, we don't care about the tablet or the TV, but we can still make use of um, perhaps the desktop and mobile. So this is the feature, the predicate that we use to decide if a time series is useful, interesting or not, but we need to use the decision rule for this as well. And I'm going to say that we need at least half of the time series to be interesting to keep them all, or more than half, I should say. So this one has two not interesting, two interesting ones, and I've decided, arbitrary decision, you can optimize, you can choose your own decisions, to not use this disaggregation. Too much of this is sparse, too much of this is not interesting. So then I go back up and disaggregate by Germany. And I'm repeating this traversal through the graph. And this time, no one went uh, to the website on a smart TV. So that's the only one that's not interesting. So I don't want to forecast that. But on a tablet, there's a little bit more information that I can use. And three of four is interesting, passes my more than 50% rule that I made up. And I'll keep this. Repeat for the entire graph. And as a result, we can get rid of almost all of the not interesting stuff and keep the useful stuff uh, for forecasts and reconciliation. Any questions for that so far? I'll do a bit out of order. That's the last one. Yeah. So in, in graph theory or in network, if you don't consider direction, and the people will just use that to find the most important nodes. But if you just, at the moment, you don't consider directions, checking which point is important, then you can formulate, or maybe you can find a similar graph yeah. that you have now. Yeah, the um, direction helps with a really uh, yeah. where to start and how to disaggregate. Yeah. Um, if you started from a random place in the yeah. graph and went in any direction, um, most likely you'll get zero. And you'll see that at the end when I really scale this up a little bit. Um, but starting from the top is really almost necessary in order to um, stay in the time series that are interesting and not explore the problem too much. Well, what if we combine a few uh, series, for example, desktop, mobile, and other? Yes, that's a great point, and that's on the future work that I've got. Sure. Okay, so moving on, graph pruning is very practical. Uh, instead of forecasting a total of 1,305 time series in this structure, I can use a simple pruning algorithm. This is the rules that I was just going through. Um, and they're not exactly matching the graph, um, but these are arbitrary. I, with these rules, I was able to remove more than half of the data whilst keeping almost all of the information. And when I evaluated the forecasting accuracy with reconciliation, the results were comparable, if not slightly better with this pruned version. So we've saved the computation time by about half, uh, with very little cost. Now, this is uh, one small part of a much bigger picture uh, I told you at the start that there were hundreds or maybe 200 and something dimensions that you can disaggregate this data by. And I've just shown you uh, four. And we were able to already at 1,305 time series. And that's manageable, but not easy. 
What if I disaggregated by how many is this? That's eight different dimensions of the possible hundreds that exist. Um, how many different time series do you think I'll end up with when I aggregate this structure? I'll take some guesses. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. It's combinatorial. Yes. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Fifty thousand. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. You're very afraid, but you're very wrong. <laughs> there is 1.7 billion different time series if I disaggregate in this way, and I haven't even done temporal aggregation yet. So that's not forecastable. Maybe you can bring up uh, Mixler, Cortez Azul, <laughs> and use their foundation <laughs> models. Um, but again, I posit that it's not useful to do that because almost all of these time series are zero. There is no structure left at the bottom, and if I use some simple pruning techniques, I get less than 10,000 useful time series, and I don't lose much information at all. And you can control how much information you lose uh, based on the threshold of the credibility that you set. So this is feasible to forecast. Um, this is a bit ridiculous. Now imagine if we were doing the hundreds of dimensions. I've ignored some uh, quite useful disaggregators like age and sex um, in this that are available. Personally, I prefer not to use it, but if you did, combinatorics, you'll quickly get into the trillions or more grains of sand than on Earth, atoms in the universe. So as a summary, uh, the, this solves big problems with forecast reconciliation, especially relating to scale. Uh, the current approach is to use very small amounts of dimensions. And essentially, to keep the data small, we're throwing away very useful dimensions for disaggregation. Using graph constraints with graph pruning, instead of dropping dimensions, we drop the useless time series at the bottom. And we're able to disaggregate by more useful things like the page location and uh, the source medium, uh, which has much more signal for forecasting and reconciliation. So once you apply this to big problems, I think you'll see a decent improvement in accuracy as well. Uh, so that's all, some key ideas, misspecification, more accurate, prune it is good. And future work, I do would like to lump things into other, like tablets and TVs, but that's a bit more difficult than it sounds with keeping coherence as well. Um, and of course, software will be out later this year. So thank you for your time. Um, while you have any questions, please give me back. <laughs> Good stuff. I mean, the lump scene you said is future works are not going there, but I'll ask you to motivate a bit more why we need to keep the scale the same. Because I would just say, well, remove all the relevant stuff and then do this at the bottom up to get all your reality and then do normal stuff. Yeah, yeah so I used uh, the feature of scale here as one example feature for average values. And this is an easy one to use, and that's why I've done it. I didn't want to do something more complicated like features. But as you disaggregate, you're definitely going to dis uh, decrease scale. So it's a uniform uh, uh, dis uniform feature. As you disaggregate, that always gets smaller. Mm -hmm. And setting it to less than 10 to reject uh, it was just a very simple way to cut out the less interesting stuff. I think a little direction to make you consider different uh, temporal application levels for different nodes. Yes, so that's uh, already working with this. If you set up temporal aggregations in a graph structure, you can traverse temporal and cross-sectional aggregations at the same time and use the same decision rules, it works. Yeah. Last question. Yeah, also it'd be just a consideration, you know, so that the pruning approach is exact, because I think you should do exact, you know? So the deciding what series or what nodes to exclude uh, in terms of forecastability or something else, I mean, um, probably you need some cross-validation, some, some thoughts of this, you know? Yeah, next steps on this, because it's... you could, um, maybe in a research sense, but you want to keep these decisions really quick because yeah. you're working with hundreds of thousands of time yeah. series. All right, we've got to go to the next talk. So thank you very much.